It comes from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost, some translations say completely, some say forever, all those that are drawing near to God through him. For he ever lives to make intercession for them. And that's exactly what's happening in heaven since October 22nd, 1844. Amen. Next month, on the 22nd, will be the 174th year since Jesus has been trying to prepare his bride for the wedding. That's a long time, isn't it? But this is the best part of the surgery. The eyesight. This is where overcoming begins to take place. Do you like it so far, the message to later this evening? Or are you scared to death and ready to get out of here? It is crucial for us to understand the Laodicean message. Apparently, no generation since October 22nd, 1844 has understood it. A lot of sincere people have passed away. And a lot of more sincere people are going to pass away until some generation gets this. It is not wrong to be a Laodicean. You know why? Because we are in the most advantageous position of all the seven churches. We have the messages from all of the other six churches that we can learn from. And now, this specific diagnosis from Christ himself. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Repent therefore. That's our contribution. He does the rest. The worst thing that you could possibly do is leave Laodicea. You would be insane to live, leave Laodicea. So we have this specialist in cancer in detecting and surgically removing it. In verse 20 of Revelation 3, that is saying, he's knocking at the door of your heart. Apparently for 174 years, the people that listened to that knock said, let's get out of here. Where's the back door? <laughs> Are we still here? Yes. So this was applied to me. Not in a negative sense, but the fact that we're alive and we can be that generation to make it happen. <laughs> this is a very unusual passage here. Revelation 3.20. Because this physician is not only the world's renowned detector of cancer and removing cancer, but he makes house calls. Do you like that? Amen. If you decide to walk out the back door, as others have done for 174 years, what you're saying to the true witness is, I like my condition of being miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I'm not interested in your surgery. Satan has succeeded in impacting most Christians with the idea that Jesus is so distant from us geographically that he really didn't identify with us in the incarnation. So that there is no way that he can have a first-hand experience and understand what you are going through in attempting to live the Christian life.
Jesus says something amazing to us. In Matthew 26, 39-44, which I shared with the Sabbath school class this morning. Matthew 26, 39-44 says, and I'm paraphrasing, they've come, they've left the upper room, they've walked to Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives. Jesus asked Peter, John, and James to pray for him. He's going through a very difficult experience. He already told them before this sun comes up in the morning, all of you are going to abandon me. And Jesus goes a little way and gets on his knees and he's praying to his heavenly father. I'm going to paraphrase this. Father, if there's any way possible for you to get me out of this, it's time to do it right now. I know that I participated in the plan of salvation in heaven. I know that in Revelation 13, 8, it's recorded that I'm the lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I know all of that. I waited 4,000 years to go to planet Earth and redeem the human race. I know all of that. But now that I'm facing the bullet, I'm asking you, come up with another plan to redeem the human race so that I don't have to go to the cross. What aspect of Jesus is making that first request? Is it his divinity or his humanity? Amen. I'm glad that Jesus did not end his prayer there. Amen. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So, There's clear evidence from Jesus' personal experience that he identified with us at the Incarnation and that he faced worse challenges on this earth than you and I will ever face. That's the reality of it. Now I'm going to share with you the grammar aspect of it. Do you believe that this is the inspired Word of God? Yes. Okay. It wasn't written, written originally in English, okay? Some people actually believe that. I've met people that believe that the Bible was originally written in English. There's a very interesting word that I want to take, draw your attention to. In Hebrews 4.15, you don't have to look it up. It says, For we have such an high priest that can identify with our weaknesses. Do you know what the weakness, the word weakness, what it means in the Greek language? It has two definitions. It's speaking of physical deformity. By the way, does the Bible ever say that Jesus was deformed in any way physically? Was he missing an ear, an arm, a leg, an eye? No. No. The only other usage for the word weakness, and the Greek word is asteria, is speaking of moral weakness. Did Jesus ever sin in thought, word, or act? No. But in order to ethically and legally save me, he had to identify the incarnation with my weaknesses. He took on my moral weaknesses genetically. Do you like the fact that biblically the high priest has identified with you in such an intimate way? Amen. Can you identify with him? I'm going to close by sharing with you something very, very special. I learned this many years ago, and I'm shocked at how few people understand Revelation 3.20. I want you to look at it right now. Revelation 3.20. Just a few, the first few words. Behold, I stand at the door and what? That's it. Do you know that this is a direct quote from the Old Testament? Yeah. Psalm of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. Some people say that the Song of Solomon doesn't begin be done in the Bible because it's an immoral, erotic book. In chapter 5, verse 2, we have a little drama playing out. There's a man knocking on the door of his girlfriend's house to let him in. He's 
nighttime. She's comfortable in bed, tucked in. He says, oh, no. Not now. And she doesn't answer the door. That is a direct quote from the Septuagint Greek version of the Song of Saul. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever believes that this is an erotic and immoral story, Jesus is refuting that because he's placing his stamp of approval by pouring directly from it. The spiritual application to you and to me is Jesus is knocking on the door of our hearts. We his symbolic bride to be. Unfortunately, no generation since October 22nd, 1844, has chosen to open that door as a generation, as a group of people. <clears throat> but I pray that you will soon choose to open that door for him. God bless you. A closing hymn is number 289. Thank you.